Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, I think this is my first podcast recorded after my events in Vancouver with Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein moderating. I think that's true. In any case, those were very fun events. We all had fun. The audience certainly seemed to have fun. And they were quite interesting. In large part, they had the character of debates. No punches were pulled, but the feeling was quite positive, both on stage, no matter how hard-hitting the conversation got, and uh, certainly between events and afterwards. I actually had dinner with Jordan last night, along with Joe Rogan and Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro and Eric Weinstein and uh, Jordan's wife, Tammy. So it is very interesting because there are many things we disagree about. I actually just did Ben Shapiro's show that hasn't aired yet. There's a lot that Ben and I disagree about. There's a lot that Jordan and I disagree about. But these disagreements are held and explored in the context of a lot of goodwill. And that's something that's not always possible, unfortunately, especially when the other side is arguing in bad faith. But the net result is we're having interesting conversations and not at all shying away from deep disagreements, but doing it in a way that not only spares the relationship, but makes good relationships possible and interesting. We're all a work in progress, as are these relationships and conversations, but I can just say that I share many people's perception that this is a very welcome and all too novel phenomenon now when talking about topics of this kind. And it is being made possible largely by the change in format. So, I mean, as a point of comparison, Ben Shapiro was just on Real Time with Bill Maher the other night. And many of us noticed that. The exchange, he he was given the the interview at the top of the show, which is usually about 10 minutes long. And many of us noticed that the exchange was unnecessarily confrontational in in a kind of vacuous way. I mean, it it was confrontation over not much of anything in the end. But that seemed to be defined almost entirely by the constraints of the format. I mean, the, the fact that there's only 10 minutes even though that sounds like an abundance of time and and is an abundance of time compared to other interview slots on television, it exerts such an unnatural pressure on the conversation where the host, in this case Bill, is trying to make something happen and make it be funny on schedule, and Ben is trying not to put his foot in his mouth and trying to make sense. And the whole thing is so fraught, and it just closes down every opportunity for a good faith exploration of ideas and differences. In any case, whether audiences are thinking about it or not, I think people are noticing that there's something dysfunctional and anachronistic about the usual format that so many conversations are are being forced into, this procrustean bed of a network's or radio station's schedule. And it's something that podcasts are completely free of. It is a difference in the media to which I I feel I can attribute many of the productive exchanges I've been having and and exchanges now that are migrating to the stage. And Jordan Peterson and I will be on stage again soon in Dublin and London. I believe tickets will always still be available for that because these arenas are enormous. So... At the last minute, you can decide to come to one of these events, and I'm pretty sure there will be a seat for you. And uh, Jordan, I'm told, has just been added to the final panel for the New York City conference in November. The um, title of that panel is Is Reason Sacred? But that, as you might recall, follows many interesting panels, one on Me Too, one on race, and one on Islam. And that really looks like it's going to be a, a great day of conversation. And as always, more information about events of that kind is available on my website at samharris.org. Okay, my guest today is Masha Gessen. Masha is a writer for The New Yorker. She's been publishing there since 2014 and uh, joined the staff in 2017. 
She's the author of nine books, including The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, which won the National Book Award in 2017, and The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. She writes for the New York Review of Books as well and the New York Times. And she's also been a science journalist, writing about AIDS and medical genetics, mathematics. She once wrote for a popular science magazine in Russia, but then got fired for refusing to send a reporter to observe the great Vladimir Putin hang gliding with Siberian cranes. She's a visiting professor at Amherst College. She's won a Guggenheim Fellowship, a, a Carnegie Fellowship, a Neiman Fellowship. And I've, I've long wanted to get Masha on the podcast. I've been a fan of her writing for years. We cover many controversial topics here, Russia and Putin and Trump, but also the Me Too movement. And we touch concerns about immigration and the differences between Christian and Muslim intolerance a bit, fake news, the health of journalism. And I found it very satisfying to get Masha's point of view on the podcast. So, without further delay, I bring you Masha Gessen. I am here with Masha Gessen. Masha, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. So, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. I will obviously properly introduce you in the intro and and link to your books, but I don't think we'll be focusing on your books here. I I want to cover many of the topics you cover so well for The New Yorker. And these may seem unrelated. I want want to talk about Russia and and what's going on there and and the relationship between Russia and and the U.S. I want to talk about the Me Too movement. And perhaps we'll, if we have time at the end, we can talk about immigration, which you've touched on recently. And these might seem unrelated, but they, they really are almost unified in, in the character who currently occupies the, the presidency of the United States as problems that are both real, but also easy to exaggerate or misconstrue as a kind of political overreaction to Trump. And I, I, I'm increasingly worried that any false note here, any dishonesty in, in how we treat these issues becomes just so counterproductive that, you know, in the aggregate, just seems guaranteed to get him reelected. Let's just, before we dive into all of that, let's just start with your background, because you have a, a fascinating story. For those who don't know you, how, how is it that you came to be writing what you're, you're writing and, and doing it in the U.S.? So I was born in the Soviet Union in 1967. I came to this country with my parents when I was 14, so in 1981. So I was educated here, uh, and I got my start as a journalist in the gay press in the 1980s. I spent several years writing about AIDS, which was great training. And then in 91, I went back to the Soviet Union, still the Soviet Union, on assignment, and that sort of shifted my entire journalistic career. And eventually, I moved back to Russia and lived there for more than 20 years. And then I was, uh, and I became both, I kept writing for American publications and writing books in English, but I was also writing for Russian magazines and then edited several Russian magazines in succession. And then I was kind of driven out of the country um, at the same time that many people were driven out of the country. Um, uh, during the crackdown that began after Putin's re-ascension to, um, to the so-called presidency in 2012. So I came here at the end of 2013 and gradually sort of stopped writing for Russian publications and, um, and then became a staff writer at The New Yorker. So let's focus on the Russia piece first. Why were you specifically forced to leave Russia? Was it just the reality of what it was like to be gay and Jewish or both gay and Jewish in Russia at that point? Or was it because something you were doing journalistically? Yeah, I, I, actually being Jewish, I think, had nothing to do with it. But, um, y- you know, there are a couple of ways to, to, to look at it. One is that uh, is just that the reality yeah, of being queer in Russia and being a queer parent in, in particular, um, I was threatened specifically by name in the media by politicians um, with having my children taken away. And my oldest son is adopted, so that was, that was not an empty threat. The, the social services could have gone after me and could have um, 
sought, probably successfully, to annul the adoption. So that was that sent me into a panic, and basically packing all of our bags. Um, another way to look at it is that a large number of people who were active in the protests of 2011, 2012, and I was very active in those protests. I um, I organized a thing called um, the protest workshop, which was modeled after ACT UP. It was a large sort of clearinghouse for for protest actions. So I was um, I sort of was coordinating the, uh, a lot of the street level stuff that was happening in Moscow um, in 2011, 2012. Everyone who was visible in in leading the protests at the time was either jailed or killed or driven out of the country. And obviously, you know, being driven out of the country is the best case scenario in that case. Now, these are protests against Putin generically, or these are protests over some specific issue? Um, Well, that depends on who you ask. Uh, I think that um, the protests were framed by most people as protests against rigged elections. I think that the catalyst, in to to a large extent, the catalyst was um, sort of the blatant uh, spectacle of the transfer of power from Dmitry Medvedev, if you if you remember such a character, back to Vladimir Putin. In what they made clear was a prearranged transfer of power, uh, and the voters were expected to rubber stamp it. Now, it's not like Russia had had real elections for more than a dozen years. You know, uh, elections had become an empty ritual. But somehow, I think that the exposing how empty that ritual was, was insulting to people. I mean, there's, um, there's a way in which things can become obscene when they're, uh, when they're exposed, even if everybody knows that they exist, you know, kind of like genitalia. It's a common knowledge problem. It's in game theory. It's often referred to by that term of jargon. It's just it's different if everyone can know it, but once everyone knows it, everyone else knows it. It's impossible to not react to it. The classic example is you know if you're if you're drinking in public out of a paper bag. Well, every cop that looks at you knows that you're drinking alcohol out of that bag, but because there's a bag there, they can decide to ignore it. But if the naked bottle of alcohol is out there, well then. They can't ignore it, and it's, it's that sort of thing. That's, that's an interesting analogy. I'm not sure that it holds, um, because it suggests that uh, Russian citizens generally feel like they, they have civic duty that they need to perform if they're forced to do so. I'm not sure that that's, that's actually the case. I think, that, I think there's something sort of deeply offensive to people's sensibilities when it was made clear you know, how, how little they mattered, even though each one of them individually felt that they mattered very little. Yeah. So, so the, the, uh, that's how the protests were framed. For me, you know, the, the, they were really anti-Putin protests. I mean, that's, that's, that's what drove me. I didn't, um, I didn't want Vladimir Putin to <laughs> preside over um, free and clear elections because I don't actually think it's possible. Um, but I thought that um, if the rest of my compatriots were willing to, for once, pay attention to the fact that the entire electoral system had been dismantled, then that was a good thing. And certainly, you know, the protests were incredibly inspiring and invigorating. Well, so what do we actually know about Putin that is uncontroversial? I mean, it, it, we're living in this surreal moment now where Putin appears to be popular, at least among Republicans in the U.S., and we, <laughs> we have a president who will not say a bad word about him. And I, I want to talk ultimately about the consequences and implications of that. But what can you say as a journalist about Putin that, is, that you really feel is not, in fact, disputable? Um, that's kind of a huge question. I mean, you know, I wrote um, a fairly long book about Putin that, um, that was essentially a compilation uh, of, of things that we know about Putin. If someone were to say, well, listen, he's, you know, all leaders of countries, you know, have to take a hard line from time to time, and he's, he's not better, but he's certainly not much worse than any other prominent leader on the world stage. And it's not a terrifying obscenity that we have a president of the United States who treats him as a normal leader. What would be the first things you would say to, you know, what, what would you pick out of Putin's bio that would argue against that kind of carefree attitude? Uh, Putin is a bloody dictator who jails and kills his opponents and has waged several illegal wars. 
uh, to the tune of hundreds of thousands of lives. And so I do not think it is okay to treat him as a normal leader, no matter how much the current American president aspires to be like him. And but what's the status of public opinion generally in Russia now, insofar as you can gauge it, both toward Putin and toward the U.S. and Europe? Because what we see, at least what someone pretty far from the facts, like myself, sees in the media is the suggestion that there is a an extraordinary degree of anti-U.S. and anti-European sentiment there, and that some of this is kind of framed as of a piece with Putin's popularity as a leader, that he's kind of bringing back the strong country of Russia that has been so demeaned, really, since the fall of the Soviet Union. How would you describe public opinion in Russia? Well, I wouldn't describe public opinion in Russia. What I would say is that uh, in a country that has no public and no opinions, it is very difficult to talk about public opinion. And I mean that literally. Putin, over his 18-year reign, has presided over the near-complete destruction of the public sphere. You can't have public opinion without a public sphere. If only a particular position a hysterical, mobilizing, you know, country under siege position as it happens. But really, any position becomes the singular position that that dominates the entire public sphere. Then you can't have any meaningful opinion either, right? And that's that's why the subtitle of my my book uh, is How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, because the lived experience of being in Russia now is the lived experience of being under totalitarianism, even though Russia doesn't have a totalitarian regime, it doesn't have a regime of state terror. But what it does have is a total domination over the thoughts and feelings and perceptions um, of its citizens. So there is no such thing as public opinion. But that view, the view that dominates, that emanates from the Kremlin and that dominates the public sphere uh, or what passes for a public sphere in Russia is... The, the opinion that Russia is a country under siege and that it, it is at war with the United States. And that war is being fought by proxy in Ukraine and in Syria. So that, well, that's scary because even if you can imagine most Russians are not happy with how Russia is being governed, if you think that there's a, a consensus that really the, the, the real enemy is, is outside and, and uh, it's the U.S., it, it, it paints a picture of the potential for a dangerous level of support for a ramping up of aggression. I mean, why, like I remember hearing at one point that the prospect of nuclear war with the U.S. was being kind of casually referenced in the context of some political campaign. I don't know if it, if it was Putin's or, or someone else's in Russia. And <laughs> there's, there's, there, there's nobody else in Russia. Right, so, <laughs> or one of his uh, who proxies. Runs political campaigns. Yeah. But you know, the idea that the prospect of, of nuclear war, in particular between Russia and the United States, could be a kind of happy talking point over there. First, first of all, do I have that? Is that factually correct? Or What is that story that I'm dimly recalling? It's an understatement. Um, It's not just the stuff of political campaigning. It is enshrined in Russia's military doctrine um, that I believe was changed in 2012. Don't quote me on that. It may have been 2013. Um, But um, um, the Russian military doctrine reserves the right of first strike in response to any attack, including a non-nuclear one, that threatens the integrity of the Russian Federation. And uh, the Russian military doctrine also identifies the United States and NATO member countries as its primary strategic enemies. Well, I can only imagine we have a similar doctrine, right? We haven't haven't disavowed any possibility of first strike on our side, have we? I would have to check, but I believe that, according to the military doctrine, first strike is actually reserved for immediate nuclear threat or nuclear strike. Mm. Uh, and that is, a, that is a difference. Right, so the bar is higher. So the belief that America is the enemy is, insofar as you can, you say you can't really judge public opinion, but you, you feel that this notion is fairly well subscribed, however cynical people might be about the information that comes to them through state-run media? 
I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying, uh, or maybe I'm not making myself very clear. That's quite Um, possible. I'm not saying that public opinion can't be judged. I'm not saying that people are cynical. I'm saying that public opinion actually doesn't exist. I'm saying that people have been robbed of the ability to form their own opinions, right? So it's just not a thing that is. Um, So all we have to deal with is what, you know, what we see in the Russian media. You believe you can't gauge how much the, the products of the Russian media that we see significantly influences the view of people on the ground in Russia. No, 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 Sam. I'm saying people don't have views. <laughs> but, but, but how is that possible? Like, if, if, you were, if we were going to ask everyone in Russia whether they thought America was a good place or a bad place, and they all answered that question one way or the other, you would say that the answer would be meaningless? or Yes, I would say that the answer would be meaningless because you can predict with 90% accuracy, or actually 86% accuracy, as the polls show, that people will say exactly what was last on television. So if the television is talking about the United States being the enemy, then if you conduct a public opinion poll, then you would get 86% of people saying, yes, the United States is our enemy. If tomorrow we become best friends with the United States, people will say exactly that. That's what a totalitarian society looks like. And that's what I mean when I say that people don't actually have views or you know, they are, uh, it, it is a matter of survival in a totalitarian state to be able to accurately mirror the signal that comes from above. Well, that's interesting. It, it sort of, well, so I'll just put the question to you. Given that, is there potentially a silver lining to Trump's approach to Russia? The fact that we have this glad handing narcissist who simply does not care or maybe even seem to know about the human rights violations of the people he's creating photo ops with, the fact that Trump is taking that approach to Putin, and we'll, we'll leave aside the, the Russian hacking scandal and everything else that might trouble us, is there a potential silver lining there in that relations can thaw between the U.S. and Russia, and then a, a, a different message gets passed to the Russian population, and we essentially de-escalate a very tense situation, albeit with various casualties. I mean, it doesn't help people in Syria. It doesn't help people in Russia all that much. But it, it does possibly close the door a little bit to the prospect of some horrible conflagration between Russia and the U.S. Mm, I don't see how that happens, because you know, the imaginary mortal combat between the United States and Russia is not a function of American politics or American behavior. It is a function of Putin's need to have a mobilizing idea. The only mobilizing idea large enough to fit sort of the the superpower ambitions left over from the Soviet Union is the idea of conflict with the United States. Putin has absolutely no interest in having that conflict diffused because his entire politics is constructed around that conflict. So that's interesting. So, so let's, we have this summit or this meeting coming up between Trump and Putin. Let's say that is yet another instance of just happy talk between the two leaders. How will Putin represent that internally to Russia? He will show that the American president has come asking for a meeting, that that acknowledges that Russia is regaining its superpower status. I mean, that is the ultimate ambition. The ultimate, uh, the ultimate sort of insult, as Putin has framed it, is Russia's loss of its place as one of the two poles of power in the world. And Russia's ambition is to reclaim that, 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 uh, that place. And so Trump's desire, his near begging for a summit with Putin, is a reflection of, of, of Putin's success. And that's how it's going to be framed in Russia. So if we had a different president and a different policy, what would you want the U.S. posture to be with respect to Russia now? I mean, is there anything that would in your mind, reliably move us in a productive direction or or put pressure on Putin that would be not merely edging us toward conflict, but actually destabilize him within Russia? 
I don't know that that's possible, and so I don't think that that's how we need to think about foreign policy. You know, Republicans are terribly fond of talking about values-based foreign policy, uh, which they haven't practiced since, uh, you know, at least the times of Reagan, if ever. But I think that that's actually how we need to be thinking about it. Um, And that requires a real reframing. You have to admit that it's extremely unlikely that any American actions will actually influence Putin's politics. Putin's politics are determined by his own logic of survival. So the question becomes not how do we destabilize Putin, but what is the right thing to do? Or perhaps more um, productively, what are the wrong things to do? It is wrong to sit down with a dictator who murders his opponents. It is wrong to seek to have common ground with a dictator who murders his opponents. It is wrong to even entertain the possibility of an alliance with a leader who is waging illegal wars. So everything you just said, at least for me, could be said about North Korea. Do you view them as similar situations? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so let's let's just talk about Trump and the, in the U.S. context. Well, first of all, what what do you believe is true that explains Trump's unwillingness to notice anything unsavory about Putin? The Mueller investigation runs its course. We find out everything we're going to find out. Is there a there there in your mind? Uh, you know, whether it's financial entanglements or something more unseemly? What, what, what do you think is true? And what do you think the consequences are of our, it seems that half the U.S. population simply doesn't care what, what may or may not be true and just views it as a witch hunt? So first of all, I don't think that you can ask, um, you know, what do you think is true? Uh, I, there are things I know to be true, and there are things I know that I don't know. Right. Well, but given what you know to be true, what would not surprise you? I mean, first, obviously, I would like, I appreciate the bright line between what you think you know to be true and everything else is conjecture, but conjecture is as much as you're comfortable with, I guess. Well, so what we know to be true is that Trump has never met a dictator he didn't like. So in a sense, we don't need um, the Mueller investigation to explain his evident affinity for Putin. He has a desperate desire to be liked and affirmed by the dictators of the world. He has an understanding of power that is as close uh, to the understanding of power that, you know, that is reflected by Duterte or Putin or, you know, the leaders of North Korea and China um, or even Bibi Netanyahu as close, you know, that, that's his understanding of power. That's what he understands. He does not understand sort of the imperfect, incomplete power wielded by elected officials in in actual democracies. Yes. The strong man archetype of the the leader is is the one he recognizes and seems to want to embody. And he wants 100% of Americans to, to support him. He thinks that that is the desired outcome. He doesn't understand that that's what happens in a totalitarian society. So how much have you gone down the rabbit hole of thinking about, reading about, wondering about more of a ulterior motive for not criticizing Putin, his own financial needs for his his real estate branding empire? Well, again, evidently we don't need to find an ulterior motive to understand what's going on here. A crucial difference would be in revealing the latter, you know, that would seem impeachable. A fondness for dictators, while perhaps it should be impeachable, is not the kind of thing that can be made salient enough, it seems, to his fellow Republicans that they will even comment on it, much less act against it. I don't think anything is impeachable until, um, you know, at least the House of Representatives is majority Democrat. Yeah, well, that, that may be the case. So, you know, Again, it's like uh, if you're asking me about sort of the instrumental, uh, the instrumental truth, I'm kind of not terribly interested in that. I think we have a fairly 
clear understanding of the Trump phenomenon and his affinity for dictators. I mean, I'm not saying that the Mueller investigation shouldn't proceed, it should absolutely proceed, and I think the more we learn from it, the better. I don't expect it to be revelatory. Well, so then how concerned are you, given Trump's apparent affinity for dictators, how concerned are you that our own democratic institutions might not be up to the, the challenge of fully reining him in? I mean, so just let's imagine for argument's sake that he gets reelected in 2020. You've written somewhat about this, that just what it's like to be in a totalitarian society or society that is losing its its democratic moorings. Again, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that we're here and that we have such a difference of perception across the aisle politically. I mean, we have, we have something like half of American society that doesn't seem to notice or care about all of the things you and I notice and care a lot about in Trump. I mean, it's the fact that we have a leader who has all of the instincts you just described, who's you know, more concerned about applause and the size of his crowds and hankers for military parades and everything out of him seems like just the, the most benign interpretation is, is just the dumb ejaculation of a, a teenager's ego, essentially. But, you know, I think you are concerned that it's, it's more sinister than that. So what, what do you, how do you view American democracy in the age of Trump now? Yeah, so I don't, you know, I don't think there's anything more sinister than uh, than the dumb ejaculations of a, of a teenager's huh. ego. That's, that's beautifully put. Um, in in power, yeah, right. Um, in fact, you know, democratic institutions are not designed for bad faith actors. They can't withstand it. They depend on on everybody more or less playing by the rules. And, and it's, you know, that, the, the, the sort of the bad faith acting did not begin with Trump. It certainly you know, began much earlier um, with the gridlock in Congress. And, and now, you know, we're reminded once again of the, of the shameful spectacle of the non-confirmation or of, 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 of Mary Garland. But, um, but what we have seen, for example, with the travel ban over the last year and a half, I think is a very good example of what happens um, when, on the one hand, you have democratic institutions that are designed to be collaborative and deliberative, and on the other hand, a dumb, blunt force. The dumb, blunt force will actually win, right? If one side tries to find an imperfect solution and a temporary consensus, and the other side is not at all interested in any of that and just wants to push through, it will succeed in pushing through. Well, on the travel ban, I I would think some of my audience would want to know what I think about that. I've commented on it elsewhere. As you probably know, I've been very worried about the spread of jihadism and Islamism and those contagious ideas that jump borders, whether or not people move across them. And I think the travel ban is an, is an idiotic response to a, a real challenge. So, you know, I don't support it, but, you know, the, my non-support of it is in no way minimizing the challenge we have with Islamism. And, and, the, you know, and there's nothing to envy in Europe now with unchecked immigration leading to this rise of, you know, right-wing populism. And, I mean, it's just, you know, we are just by dint of good luck surrounded by oceans and not having to to respond to precisely that same problem but i do think that you know even acknowledging the challenges in europe i think the travel ban is certainly the wrong approach here i don't know if you have if you have any thoughts on that but well i think that we we agree that the travel ban is the wrong approach uh i think we disagree on um on the comparison you just made between the United States and Europe, because I don't think that, I mean, to the extent that you can um, link the rise of the right in Europe to the influx of refugees, you can do the same thing here. Uh, Even the specter of immigration in the public imagination is enough to fuel the fear that in turn fuels Trump's politics. Um, the fact that the United States took 11 refugees last year 
doesn't change this, you know, the, this sense of of um, of coming doom. And that, of course, is also true of several European countries that took a piddling number of refugees, but are seeing the far right rise in in response to to perceived threat. It doesn't help that you can actually find the cases where the fears can seem justified in Germany or in England. Or yeah, I mean, it's just that there's clearly a less than ideal situation. Which the basic problem there is forget about the recent refugee crisis. There's just a, a problem with kind of the failure of assimilation there, which you have to take England as the as the clearest case. If you know, if you run a poll among not even immigrants, but, you know, second generation British citizens who happen to be Muslim asking, you know, whether homosexuality is morally acceptable, the, the response is zero percent finding it morally acceptable. I mean, that's a public attitude that suggests a failure of assimilation that, that should be troublesome. Now, granted, the, the farthest of the far right populace are not so concerned about tolerance of homosexuality, one presumes, but that's an example of the kind of lack of assimilation that could worry reasonable people and think that, okay, we've probably had enough of this immigration stuff for a while until we can figure out how to get the various communities in our society to agree about, you know, how to live in a civil society. You know, I mean, as, um, as a homosexual Jew, I am not willing to exchange sort of my uh, or let me put it this way: As a homosexual Jew, I am not willing to sacrifice Muslims' s- sense of safety and security in the society in which I live for my own. And I think that's very much sort of the function of of the of the of the rhetoric uh, that 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 we hear both in this country and and much more prominently in Europe. Well, certainly some of the rhetoric, but there's also, there's a problem of assimilation. I mean, there's a problem of I mean, Islamism, the, the, the expectation that, that Islam will become an ascendant political force and that the West will eventually bend the knee and Sharia law will be implemented globally, right? This idea that is subscribed by some percentage of the Muslim community wherever there is a Muslim community, that's a problem of a clash of ideas and worldviews that we have to figure out how to solve. And we shouldn't be eager to import those ideas, those convictions, as quickly as possible into our society, no more so than we would want to import any other totalitarian fantasy into our society, if we can help it. That's the concern. I mean, if if you tell me that we have... 100,000, and, and this is a bit of a departure from the topic I wanted to hit with you, but just it's kind of interesting that we're disagreeing here. If, we have, if you tell me there's 100,000 refugees from the Middle East that really need a home and they, we're going to move them all to San Diego, and you tell me that they're all Christian, beleaguered Christians who, are, who uh, require movement to the, to the West to be safe from their highly sectarian neighbors, that's a, a completely legitimate claim upon asylum, it sounds like, to me. And it comes with an assurance, insofar as we know who these people are, that none of these people are jihadists, right? None of these people have any fondness for al-Qaeda or ISIS. And that's all good news. I, I think you would probably acknowledge that. No. I wouldn't. You wouldn't no, say would, that a fondness for ISIS is bad news. <laughs> let me let me now that I've I've claimed this identity of the homosexual Jew. You know, I feel much more threatened in this country by the increasingly powerful Christian right than by the power, powerless and marginalized Muslim community. Well, sure, but they may be equally intolerant of who I am, but but the ones have the power and the guns, and the others don't. So no. Both of those can be true. I mean, so for, you're just not acknowledging that there's a. I'm I'm not acknowledging that it's good news. I'm I'm, I'm saying that you know, the, uh, I I think that both groups have valid asylum claims, but you know, I am not going to get any more excited about a, an imaginary group of fundamentalist Christians than I am going to get it about about a, a, an imaginary group of fundamentalist Muslims. Well, I didn't say they were fundamentalists, but so you you wouldn't acknowledge that there's there's a difference in the the level of, of theocratic uh, 
hostility toward homosexuality? Absolutely not. There's no difference across Christianity because that and Islam? is simply not true. Look, I've spent you know I've I've I've, I've spent um, I've spent time reporting on you know the white evangelical uh, inter- anti queer international. It's scary as fuck, and um, and I don't find it any less scary than uh, the, the, than fundamentalist Muslims. It is scary and and reprehensible. I'll grant you that. And and you know I have never spared the Christian right my criticism. But in terms of the actual level of murderous intolerance among Christians for homosexuality in this case, it is a tiny minority in the U.S. in terms of what, you know, if you could poll all the Christians and ask, do you think sodomy should be a killing offense? I would expect a a tiny minority to say yes. In the Muslim world, we know the poll results there, and that's just not true. It's a far bigger number. And it's, it's carried out in ways. I mean, it's just, just take, you know, I mean, and this is of a piece with every other kind of kind of knee-jerk theocratic reaction to anything. I mean, the difference between burning a Bible and burning a Quran is rather stark. It's not to say that you couldn't find some Christian who would want to kill you over burning a Bible, but it wouldn't be guaranteed to produce the kind of reaction we know we would get in the Muslim community. Um, Sam, I think you, you did, uh, probably unintentionally, but you did a kind of interesting bait, bait and switch there. So you said if you, we poll Christians in the United States, we'd get a tiny minority. But in the Muslim world, we would get a majority. Now, if you actually poll people in the Christian so-called world, an Orthodox Christ, uh, country like Russia, where a majority of people believe that homosexuality should be a killable offense. Since the Kremlin started engaging in that, in that propaganda, so um, you know, I don't, uh, and and you know, I wrote a book about uh, two women who went to jail for two years for lip syncing in a cathedral. Uh, so you know, let's let's not get into the uh, Christians are so much more tolerant than Muslims um, debate. I just don't think it's meaningful. I think that, um, and I think that what's more important is that. We st- you started with the t- with the, with the term failure of assimilation, and I think you know there there are different ways of thinking about it, uh, and I think that it's much more useful to think of it as a failure of the commons, right? We have not seen any Western European country with a large and disenfranchised Muslim population have that community influence its politics. I mean, we, what we have seen is almost you know, unremitting progress on all sorts of social issues, even while the Muslim populations in all the Western European countries have grown. So I think that the specter of national pol- policies and politics changing in the direction of Sharia law is an absolute red herring and a xenophobic one at that. What I think should be of concern and is of concern is, a disenfranch- is the disenfranchisement of communities that feel completely left out of, of national politics to whom these policies of social progress are entirely alien, and that's a problem. But, you know, let's not frame it as a threat to, you know, quote-unquote, our way of life or a failure to assimilate. Let's frame it as a, as a failure of the commons, and let's try to figure it out that way. Yeah, well, all of this is very interesting because I didn't realize that your experience in Russia was working in the background here. So just to sharpen it up so that no one misses it, it's your sense that the rekindling of Orthodox Christianity in Russia in recent years has exposed a similar level of religion-based intolerance of the sort that I perceive in the Muslim world. I think that um, religious rhetoric, uh, much more than faith, is instrumentalized in you know, mobilizing these kinds of xenophobic, um, frightening and frightened movements, and in um, in delegating violence and 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 sort of de- uh, designating entire groups of the population, primarily LGBTQ people, as uh, legitimate targets of violence. I have experienced that violence. I have seen that, observed that violence. Um, and yeah, so for me, you know, the, the, it doesn't really matter which, which variety of religious rhetoric you instrumentalize. It's very, very easy to do.
Right. Okay. Well, just to uh, close the loop on one concern I heard you raise about, about xenophobia, I should just say that my view of the the failure of assimilation in in a country like the UK, for instance, is not something that I'm forming from from outside, and it's certainly not something that that I'm getting based on you know an interview seen on Fox News where someone talks about no go areas in in some Western European country. It's much more through collaborations with Muslim reformers and ex-Muslims who live in those countries and and have to work in those countries and and speak in those countries and try to reform public opinion in the Muslim community. And I mean, it's people like Majid Nawaz, who runs the Quilliam Foundation, and a variety of his collaborators. And so these are people who are either currently reformed, liberal, cosmopolitan, but nonetheless Muslims, or people who are you know, apostates within the Muslim community who've lost their faith and want to be free to talk about what they consider to be a rational worldview, but who live under perpetual threat of violence for merely no longer subscribing to their religion. There is a difference. Being an ex-Christian doesn't cause you to live under the shadow of death threats for the rest of your life anywhere but, I mean, perhaps in Uganda now. I mean, you'd have to look long and hard for the Christian community that wants to kill you over this. And it is routine for ex-Muslims to be in hiding for the rest of their lives for good reason. And this even touches someone who wouldn't imagine they have any connection to this, this particular war of ideas. But if you're, you know, if you're a cartoonist and you decide one day to draw the Prophet Muhammad, as you know, this can be a life-deranging event. And you could draw anything about Jesus to your heart's content, and it's just not a problem. So there's something corrosive, I, I think, about not acknowledging that difference, because not all communities are, are quite playing by the same rules at this moment. Fair enough. Um, but let me, let me, let me just um, refer to my own experience, which is, um, which is actually continuity, right? Uh, Russia ha- ha- is a majority Russian Orthodox country with a very large Muslim minority. And uh, uh, it's the second uh, most um, you know, prominent religion in, um, in Russia is, is, is Islam. So what we have seen is uh, anti-gay violence all over Russia taken to extreme in Chechnya, where there are purges and uh, killings of gay men. And gay men have fled uh, first Chechnya and then Russia for other countries under the threat of death and have to look for places where they can get asylum, where there isn't a Chechen uh, diaspora because they have reason, as you correctly stated, uh, you know, to fear death for the rest of their lives at the hands of their compatriots. But I really see it as a continuity, right? Um, what, uh, what takes the shape of um, a sort of delegated non-state violence for, in most of Russia, in, its, uh, in, in Chechnya, which is also a part of Russia, takes the shape of, of formalized you know, state-sanctioned violence. But it is a function of the same campaign that emanates from the Kremlin. So yes, uh, one is more extreme, but the, the distinctions are distinctions of degree. That was fascinating and hopefully entertaining and was not a topic that uh, I was planning to touch. But so I'm going to kind of bend us back toward, I guess, before we touch Me Too, which I mean, you've written some fascinating pieces on, on that topic. I just want to ask you generally about your perception of of journalism right now and, and the, the fake news problem, the fact that the, there really is some fake news and there, there really is a, currently a, some political leverage to be had in simply calling real news that you don't like fake news and your, your constituency will buy that as well. So how do you view the, the health of journalism currently? Let's just take the U.S. as the case. So, um, you know, fake news, I've, I've been, as you can imagine, and as I'm sure you have, on an endless number of fake news panels. Um, and one thing that I realized after several of them is that fake news is always what other people read. It's never what you actually encounter in your own um, process of, of, of media consumption. 
and so is that. I think I think it's a pretty meaningless term. Um, in my media consumption, uh, I have seen I think both an incredible reinvigoration of of journalism and and some real really inspiring inventiveness, particularly where it comes to investigative stuff. Um, I'm you know I'm in love with um, the Trump Inc. podcast on WNYC, which which is a really, I think, a significantly new way of doing journalism just in the way that they um, collaborate, but also in the way they sort of define the direction in which they're moving, which is that they're, they're trying to understand Trump through studying his businesses. Right. Uh, and I think that that kind of definition is, is fairly novel, right? It's, it's like, watch us put on this, this pair of glasses and look at the world through them and sort of take part in that process of, of, of trying to decipher something in a very transparent way. And I think that that's, um, that's practicing objective journalism in the way that objective, objectivity was, was intended uh, to be practiced. And, you know, the um, transparent, clearly sourced, uh, you know, ostensibly reproducible kind of reporting. So I think that that's... Uh, uh, that's wonderful and um, you know, almost a silver lining to, to the current political moment. On the other hand, I find sort of the, the, the success with which this administration has reframed any number of conversations to be you know, absolutely horrifying. And like uh, every morning uh, on my bike, I listen to several podcasts, starting usually with The Daily from The New York Times. and. I have observed, I think, how the language keeps bending to accommodate, to normalize this administration. Like uh, this morning, Michael Barbaro, the host of, uh, of, of the Daily Podcast, was interviewing one of the Times reporters about Justice Kennedy's um, resignation and referred to Trump as not as ideologically nuanced. <laughs> as Anthony Kennedy. There should be an award for uh, understatement. Well, that's the thing. is like, you know, understatement is not a virtue in journalism. No. You know, we're not here to make things pretty. We're, we're here to state them as clearly and directly as, as that can possibly be done. And I think that sort of in the, in the, in the instinctive and sometimes articulated striving for civility, that's not happening. Um, and that has a normalizing effect. Yeah, and it's just the fact that you're you're speaking about the U.S. president and the so-called office as well, and so journalists feel like they they need to be respectful, even when the person and his utterances that they have to cover are so far beyond the pale in any given case that it's it has a normalizing effect, and it's you have to kind of shake yourself awake and and remember what is actually happening here. I mean, the level of lying and the rapidity of lying, the blatancy of the lying, the, the omnipresence of the lying, the fact that all of his surrogates are forced to lie in this sort of perverse and unending loyalty test, and with an apparent shamelessness that they would never muster, presumably, in their normal lives. It's like there's this black hole of dishonesty in the Oval Office, and it's, it's bending everything that comes near the event horizon it's just been ghastly to witness but the, the for me the the worst part if there if you can distinguish these gradations of horror is that so many people not only don't care it's it's part of the fun it is a feature not a bug it's the it is the the great fuck you to the quote vested interests or the normal institutions with which they've lost faith or politics as usual or, you know, the admittedly fairly depressing character of someone like Hillary Clinton, who is basically the, the, an advertisement for everything that we, we should be tired of on some level. And yet, in disavowing politics as usual, we have much of the country, probably half of the country, willing to disavow any kind of expertise or professionalism or civility at the level of, of leadership. And it's, it's, a real, it's a real breakdown of, of what is, should be expected you know, from, from our government. And yet, 
not only does no one seem to care among his supporters, this is the, the whole point of the exercise, just to shake it all up and, and let's see what happens. Right. No, I completely agree. And, you know, the, the problem that you began with uh, the, the, uh, of covering the office and the president while also covering this particular president who's occupying that office, it's a real problem. You do, as a journalist, have to have some respect for the office and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the institution of the presidency. Um, not, you know, necessarily sort of ceremoni- ceremonial and fawning kind of respect, but just because the office and, 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 and the actions of the person in that office are incredibly consequential. Yeah. So you can't be dismissive of words that call on you to be dismissive because they're stupid or because they're lies. But because they're lies uttered by somebody who holds this office, you have to engage with them. And by engaging with them, you become trapped in the whole conversation that, you know, that, that gives weight to something that should have no weight, but it already has weight because he's, got, he's the president. And it really is a catch-22. And, um, you know, I think there's a way to deal with it better than most journalists are dealing with it. But there isn't a way to deal with it well. Okay, so let's pivot to the other topic that I really want to touch with you, and uh, we'll see if there's a way to deal with this well, because this is a, a difficult topic. Me too. I mean, you, you wrote in, I think it was back in December, you wrote a, a piece in The New Yorker titled Al Franken's Resignation and the Selective Force of Hashtag Me Too. And you, and this piece really struck me. That, well, one, th- one thing you said is, this is now quoting you, the force that is ending his political career, this is Al Franken, is greater than the truth. This force operates on only r- roughly half of this country's population, those who voted for Hillary Clinton and who consume what is still refer- we re- still refer to as mainstream media. And what you acknowledge in that piece is that there's this, there's this spectrum of indiscretion that we need to figure out how to talk about and, and respond to. And it, it ranges from true criminality on one extreme, rape and, and sexual assault, to bad jokes and inept flirting on the other. And so you, and you've worried that we're being plunged into this wholesale renegotiation of sexual norms in our society, and it's causing us to ignore these, these important moral distinctions, that there is a spectrum here, and you know, Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein are on one side of it, and I think everyone agrees that they deserve all the outrage that's been directed at them and whatever legal process gets directed at them. But then there are cases that are, are far less clearly about abuse on the part of the men involved. And, and there, there really seem to have been a few cases where they were just fairly normal sexual misadventures that just got nearly criminalized in the media. So feel free to demur if, you're cha- if your, your views have changed on this at all. But Let's talk about, are there, are there some clear landmarks here? How are you thinking about Me Too and the response to it, and, and perhaps what you described at one point as an emerging, quote, sex panic, or as uh, you know, I would refer to more generically as a moral panic? What, how are you thinking about Me Too at the moment? So um, I have a lot of thoughts about Me Too, and uh, my biggest frustration with it is that um, we're not having a nuanced conversation about it at all. And I think there are reasons why we're not having a nuanced conversation about it, but that's, uh, you know, I think when it comes to sex, especially, the conversation needs to be uh, careful and, uh, and we need to be able to parse things out. But, um, you know, what, uh, to, to start with what you, the piece that you quoted, what I was concerned about at the time, and I, and I, I think I, 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 it's still an important point about the whole movement is that it's very much a reaction to the election of Donald Trump. And I think sort of on a psychological level, it's, it's a result of the shock that many of us experienced when we saw that the Access Hollywood tape was not a disqualifying event. And I think the reaction is sort of, I don't want to be, to live in a society in which that's not a disqualifying event. So I am going to legislate the part of this country that I live in 
or participate in legislating the part of this country that I live in differently so that it becomes a disqualifying event for men who inhabit this part of the country. That, you know, I think we have to somehow try to think about that, about what happens when society is sort of trying to legislate a part of it separately, right, to create rules of behavior that don't apply, uh, that, that clearly, you know, don't apply sort of on the federal level, but apply to a fraction of society. But, um, and so, you know, the, the normal institutions are not involved. Um, and I'm not saying that that never happens, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily a terrible thing, but to me that's a thing that needs to be acknowledged and, 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 and examined. So that's, that's, that's one point. Another point is that, um, you know, the way, there, there are two kinds of uh, discourses that I have heard about Me Too. One is the language of revolution. And in this language of revolution, it suggests that there's a wholesale changeover of norms related to sex and flirting and, uh, and relationships. Um, and there, it's going to claim victims, perhaps ex- in excess of victims, because that's just how revolutions work. I find that view disturbing and unsatisfying. Another view is the view of retribution, the language of retribution, right? Uh, and that's, that's how, okay, so Al Franken did something wrong. Maybe it wasn't as an or, enormous an offense as something that sh- uh, um, should land someone in court and has rightly landed people like Bill Cosby or, uh, or Harvey Weinstein in, in, in court and in prison. But, um, but it's, there should still be retribution exacted. I'm not interested in retributive justice. I am interested in restorative justice, which is an entirely different kind of language, an entirely different way of thinking about it. So, and and you ask me what I'm thinking about Me Too now. I'm, uh, I was at the Sydney Writers' Festival when, uh, when the Juno Diaz thing went down. So Juno Diaz had written uh, an essay in The New Yorker about having been sexually abused as a child and having, for lack of a better term, acted like an asshole in his relationships uh, as a result of that. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, there was the Sydney Writers' Festival, uh, and he was confronted with a question from the floor on one, uh, during one of his panels by a younger writer, also from New York, uh, uh, who said that he had tried to forcibly kiss her. And then it had this kind of pile-on effect, both uh, from writers physically present at that festival and, and then on Twitter. And Juno Diaz withdrew from the festival. Uh, a lot of his public events were uh, canceled. Um, bookstores sta- started pulling his books. And since then, uh, MIT has conducted an investigation and has apparently concluded that uh, there's no issue with his continuing to teach there. Um, at least one of the women who uh, accused him of, uh, and she accused him really of just having like, demeaned her in, in, in public um, in a way that, that, that it really had nothing to do with sex, but as she portrayed it, ha- had everything to do with sexism, but turned out not to be true. The whole story turned out to be not true. And um, I found the experience of a bunch of writers Engaging in what, you know, what now in, in, in retrospect certainly looks like a kind of mob, you know, minor expression of mob behavior and proving themselves to be completely incapable of having an actual conversation yeah. in words, which happens to be our profession, I found that incredibly disheartening. And then there was also the Sydney Writers Festival, which kept sending out, uh, which, which just completely refused to acknowledge the whole thing. And, uh, um, and kept sending out, you know, cheery emails, saying, you know, an exciting literary weekend ahead. <laughs> right. uh, right. Instead of using this incredible opportunity to uh, to actually have a meaningful conversation. Yeah, well, it really, it, it does come down to a failure of conversation. It's like there are certain topics where 
everyone has a certain tripwire installed in their mind. And, you know, once it's tripped, not only is there an, an emotional hijacking of, of each side of the conversation, there is the, the rules of civil and intellectually honest exchange get ignored, right? you know, right to, with disconcerting certainty, really. You just have you know, people who will straw man the other side relentlessly never engage with a, a, a charitable reconstruction of the view they're claiming to argue against or the set of facts they're claiming to debunk. It's a, I mean, just to take one case, which this is a, just a micro example of, of no real importance, but in hearing, you know, the Matt Lauer case talked about, what was seized upon most often in my review of it was the fact that he had a button installed at his desk that could lock his door, right? And this was spun endlessly as some kind of rape device, right? Like he's going to lock women into his office and abuse them, as though, as though even if this were possible, this would contain the, the reputational damage. I mean, like if you could just lock a woman in, once she gets out, she's not going to tell people what happened, as though this, this would be any abuser strategy. But the reality is, is that the button like that almost certainly served another purpose and, and didn't, certainly didn't lock the door from the inside. It would have locked it from the outside. It would have locked people out, right? And this is a button that would be installed if you want to make sure you, you can lock your door without having to get up if you're someone like Matt Lauer and you don't want people wandering into your office or, you know, presumably some security person advised them that if there were ever an active shooter situation in the the network, you'd want to be able to lock the doors of the principals, you know, instantly. But this couldn't possibly have been a way of him impeding a woman's escape from his clutches. And and yet this was the thing that got so much focus. And it just would have taken two seconds to have kind of thought about some other charitable interpretation of what this button could have meant. And there, you know, there are hundreds of examples of this sort of thing. It's amazing how difficult it can be just to keep a dispassionate and honest conversation going on these topics. Um, yeah, well, these are passionate topics. And, you know, I can certainly see that from the point of view of a woman who is trapped in Matt Lauer's office, if that happened, um, the existence of that button is an absolutely terrifying fact. But, but you're right, you know, about the, the, the reporting it's is devolved into into a very unsophisticated conversation. So, what has been the response to your sounding off on this topic? I mean, you've written you've written a few, if I'm not mistaken, a, a few. Yeah, I think three, three. Yeah. No, the response has been great. I've I've heard from a lot of people. I mean, there does seem to be a real age divide. I think among women. I think younger women tend to see this concern and skepticism um, as, as misguided. And women, you know, 50 and over tend, I think, to share a lot of, um, I mean, women I come in contact with, it's not a huge uh, number of women, but um, sort of in the publishing world in, in, in New York certainly uh, tend to share these concerns with, um, with the language used and with the with the sweeping accusations and 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 really just you know the um because also there was that um shitty men in shitty media men list oh that yeah the google doc yeah yeah the google doc which um again for for those listeners who uh, who might have missed it um it was a google doc uh that was put up by a young uh new york city writer in which she, I think, took great care to um, to sort of say, these are, please keep this anonymous. Uh, these are merely uh, you know, um, accusations or observations. But anyway, she she sort of tr really tried to couch it in a way as, uh, that was careful, and she intended it to be a confidential document that would warn women about men that they might want to avoid in certain circumstances. And uh, I think there's no reason to believe that she wanted it to be public. I think she, she honestly thought it could be kept 
confidential. Of course, it was uh, it it was leaked within I think hours of of going online, and she took it down very fast. But um, copies of it circulated, and have had a devastating effect I think on the well being, if not the careers of um, several men. And again, the you know there's this uh, um, there's the 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 view that I can understand that, look, you know, these incredibly privileged men who may have had aspersions cast on them have suffered some discomfort, but you know, have not suffered uh, some, some, some great loss. And I'm, and I'm convinced that the woman, Moore Donegan, who, who created the list, had no such intention. But for those men, this is not something they can take lightly, and for a lot of their um, colleagues, it is a disturbing and chilling and and sometimes you know catastrophic event and again i in this particular situation i don't think there are actually any bad actors but i think there's a pretty it's a pretty sad outcome yeah so i feel the impulse to speak a little defensively on on both of our behalfs just for a moment <laughs> because, because i don't want what i said about matt lauer's lock button to be construed as a defense of his case, because actually I'm not, I don't consider myself informed about what he did or even what the full range of allegations were about him. So, you know, he could be as terrible as alleged or, or not. I'm uninformed. I just, that was just an example of a detail that I felt was getting the most paranoid interpretation where other more plausible interpretations existed. Right. And in your defense, I just want to, you know, because you, by some listeners, I'm sure will be convicted of a somewhat galling level of insouciance around sexual harassment and this issue. But I want, I want to just read something you wrote in one of your pieces that is, is surprisingly personal and powerful here, which is it just tells people where you're coming from. Uh, this is quoting you in, in one of your New Yorker pieces. I'm not trying to straddle the divide between cultures. I fall squarely on one side of the chasm. I have written, quote, me too, because I've been raped by a man, a stranger, coerced into sex by a man, a friend, and held hostage by a man's, my boss's, compulsion to talk about sex and take and exhibit pictures of sex. I'm also queer, and I panic when I sniff sex panic. The problem is that it, and this is a little further down, the problem is that it serves to blur the boundaries between rape, nonviolent sexual coercion, and bad, fumbling, drunken sex. The effect is to criminalize bad sex and trivialize rape. Actually, I thought it was important to, to tell people Thank you. Uh, where you're Thank coming you. from. A couple, of, uh, a couple of stories have really made this clear, uh, the Aziz Ansari story and uh, the initial stories about Glenn Thrush, the New York Times reporter. And both of these stories, I mean, they're the, the, sort of the content is a little bit different, but um, they're stories about powerful men well-known men, uh, you know, one obviously a celebrity, the other not, not so much, but in their fields, powerful and well-known men, and young, ambitious women. And both of these, uh, both the women and the men, trying to wield a kind of power, a kind of sexual power, and that not working out well. Um, it was very clear to me from reading the Aziz Ansari story and from reading the Glenn Thrush story that here were women who wanted to flirt, to uh, you know, to use their sexual power, and I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get slaughtered for this, I think, <laughs> but to use their sexual power to make connections, or to even just have an interesting and you know memorable kind of social experience, but also perhaps to um, to get professional advantage. At least one of the women in the Glenn Thrush story was very clear about that, and the men then acting like assholes. And, uh, and I think that what, um, not to take anything away from, from the men a acting like assholes, except that I don't think it's, it's criminal, uh, and I'm not sure that it ought to be punishable by uh, such incredibly humiliating public exposure, but what's really missing for me in the reporting is an acknowledgement that both sides do have power. And both sides are, are and they're using, they're wielding their power asymmetrically, and it doesn't end well. But it's not because one side is entirely powerless and the other one is, is entirely powerful, which is how it's framed, which is simply not an accurate reflection of, of, of how these things work. 
in in 2017, 2018. Yeah, I think in one of your pieces, you pointed out the irony of that this is this is a massive denial of agency to women. And I think you wrote about the example of a rock star who, who recently said that he'll no longer hook up with fans, even if they've initiated things, because he, he thought the power of his fame was so compelling that they, they, could, they would be unable to truly consent to having sex with him. And, you know, I don't know, I mean, we, we might wonder about the wisdom of being a rock star, hooking up with fans again and again, but it does suggest a an almost Victorian picture of, of womanhood in 2018. Utterly infantilizing. Yeah. So to push back a little bit against the line you've taken here, I, I, I did notice that another journalist, Rebecca Traster, responded to one of your New Yorker pieces. And I'll just read what she said here, because you know she's someone who I've also invited on the podcast. We haven't made it work yet. But you know she's further to, I guess, I would be tempted to call the left of any of the noises we've been making on this topic thus far. <laughs> and so here she writes, Masha Gessen has written for The New Yorker with perspicacity in past weeks about how this moment risks becoming a sex panic, that one of the perils at hand as we try to parse how butt-groping or unsolicited kissing can exist on the same scale as violent rape is a reversion to attitudes about women as sexually infantilized victims. Her concerns are valid, pressing. Yet I fear that the category collapse that makes Gessen anxious is being misunderstood in part because we're making a crucial category error. Because the thing that unites these varied revelations isn't necessarily sexual harm, but professional harm and power abuse. These infractions and abuses are related, sometimes they are combined. But their impact, the reasons that they, that they are sharing conversational and journalistic space during this reckoning, need to be clarified. We must regularly remind everyone paying attention that sexual harassment is a crime not simply on the grounds that it is a sexual violation, but because it is a form of discrimination. What say you, Masha Gessen? Oh, that's an excellent point. That, that you know, I, I have really nothing to, to say to that because she puts it beautifully. No, that's, that's exactly right. Right. So, so but again, it, it, it fails to, to nominate a, a bright line that could guide the behavior of men and women in the workplace, it seems to me. So it's like if you're, I guess the bright line would be never hook up with someone beneath you in the hierarchy of your job and or whether you're in academia, you know, never, if you're a professor, never hook up with one of your graduate students or even a, you know, for, or anyone beneath you in, in the ivory tower or who could reasonably worry about their professional advancement should things go badly. Is that a, an algorithm we can just run everywhere and, and spare everyone a lot of pain? I'm not sure that that's desirable. That seems like a very appealingly legalistic way of thinking about it. But, you know, and I know that uh, that we have Tinder now. We don't really have to flirt in the workplace. <laughs> but, but come on, um, most people don't have a whole lot of social outlets outside of work. Where else are you supposed, especially in an academic setting? Okay, well, then in the absence of that, in the absence of a clear policy, something like the, the Pence rule, to remind people of this, how far he takes it. I, but, you know, it shouldn't surprise you. I meet many people in business, you know, who are, who are certainly not religious. They're not, you know, Christian theocrats, but they, they follow the Pence rule. That they just, you know, don't have a meeting alone with a woman at this point, or a lunch alone with a woman. And that's its own professional harm, it seems. I'm, I'm not the first to point I, this I, out. Yes. Yeah, I think, and, and I think that, that that needs to be worried about more. That, um, again, my own background is I've um, I spent so many years working in Russia, which in some ways is a more egalitarian society, in some ways is a much more sexist society than, than, than the U.S., um, but one of the great impediments to my work was my lack of access to bathhouses, because so many important conversations hmm. among men uh, take place in the bathhouse, and male reporters could go to the bathhouse, and I couldn't. Um, and that, to me, is 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 an image, you know, that like it, it floats to the to the surface of my consciousness immediately when I when I you know when I hear about. 
people in business not having, not taking meetings with women alone, sort of thing. And that, that creates lots of meetings when there are men alone uh, or you know, two men together. Uh, it, it's a kind of bathhouse phenomenon. Right. Well, it, at least in Russia, they had an alibi. They were n- naked and sweating and <laughs> in dirty water. So the women could hardly be invited. But in our context, we, we have no alibi. It's just going to be a nakedly harmful policy. I, I know we're getting to the end of your time here, Masha. Is there anything we haven't touched on? Is there any area you would want to explore for a few minutes? I know we've been all over the place, but it's been great to have you here. Thank you. Um, no, it's, um, you know, uh, I, I've been following your lead and it's been very interesting. So if there's something else you want to talk about. I guess I would just flag the sort of the novelty of, of some of the the points we've hit here, because we talked about how difficult conversation is and how, you know, on, on the topic of, of Me Too, it's, it's reliably breaking down and, and people are being harmed on both sides. And even, you know, people who might be getting what they want, the reckoning they want, are, are going to be harmed in, in ways that they are not quite expecting. I mean, the, 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 we just mentioned one that, you know, if, if people decide that this reckoning is so compelling that they need to be so careful as to never have unchaperoned meetings with, with women, then, you know, that's, that's certainly a bad reckoning. But you and I touched, when we were talking about Islam and Christianity, I was aware of us encountering a difference of opinion that our mutual audiences would perceive very differently. I mean, I don't know if you were aware of what a tightrope walk that was mutually, but so for just to fully spell it out, Given you know how concerned I've been about jihadism and and Islamism over the years, there are many people in my audience that would perceive your equating Christianity and and Islam at this moment in history as a kind of disqualifying level of non engagement with a with a huge problem. And I'm aware that there are many people in your audience who may or may not know my 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 history of engaging with that topic who would view my concern about the difference, as I perceive it, between public opinion in the Muslim community, say, in, in the UK and other communities, as a kind of you know, xenophobic level of you know, Fox News-inspired paranoia. And you and I are having this conversation, having to talk to both audiences and honestly represent our views. And it's and I, I thought our exchange was great, and I loved. I mean, the, the the actual piece that dropped into place for me that was truly novel was your unique vantage point, having been gay in Russia. I mean, that, that's and and the and you know the the level of of orthodox animus there, and so that was very interesting. But I, I guess the the meta point I would make is that this is the kind of thing that on social media and in most even in most you know, kind of journalistic efforts to connect the dots for, for either one of these audiences, there is just a, a straw manning and a kind of tribal level of smearing that is happening in every one of these conversations, wherein essentially the worst possible construal of one of your sentences is taken to mean that your point of view is totally beyond the pale and, and you shouldn't be interacted with on this topic and it, it it goes in both directions and i and i've i think it's it's only in a long long form conversation like this with sufficient principle of charity that we can navigate that i don't i don't know if you were viewing that part of the conversation through that lens at all but that you know that's what i was thinking no i think you've described it very well um i actually want to go back to me too for a second sure uh to acknowledge that you know the the, the mention that you made and I and I made of um, of potential professional harm of women getting left out of conversations you know it's 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 a concern I'm not sure it's my biggest concern in fact I'm sure it's not my biggest concern about me too um it may be uh, a straw man as well but I'm much more concerned actually and this was something that was prominent to me in the whole uh Juno Diaz Sydney Writers Festival story that I can't imagine that this search for this quest for retribution um, and the public exposure that some of the women accusers are getting is sort of psychically as rewarding 
or ultimately you know, beneficial as they might imagine it is. I also wonder about how damaging the the way that the conversation is proceeding is at this point to some of the accusers. I think it's uh, the exposure of personal pain to a society that, uh, or a community that doesn't really engage with it, that immediately shifts into punitive mode. I don't think that's a great thing. And, and, I, and, and, and I worry about it. And, and I, really, I felt, felt it really viscerally in, in, in Sydney. And now to hop over to what you said about our conversation um, about um, Islam and Christianity and, and assimilation and the commons. And uh, I think, you know, first of all, I think we did that pretty well. We negotiated that pretty well, and there was actually something uh, that that allows allowed us to engage. But um, but your point about the assumption of bad faith on both sides of that conversation is a really important point, point. Um, and it's a crisis of politics. Politics is a conversation about how we inhabit this world together. It can only be had if there is an assumption of good faith on both sides. Um, I think that the assumption of bad faith is not unfounded. Yeah, well, certainly in many cases. And yet, we can only have the conversation if we assume good faith. Yeah. A friend of mine, Brett Weinstein, who I just did an event with, summarizes this with the aphorism that bad faith changes everything. And it certainly does, <laughs> and not for the better. Well, listen, Masha, it's been really a pleasure to, to finally get you on the podcast. I know we were struggling Thank to work. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, we're, you, you, were, um, you had many things which for good reason delayed your arrival here, and it's exactly the conversation I was hoping to have with you, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'd like to explain why I don't run ads on the podcast, and why I've decided instead to rely entirely on listener support. And for those of you who haven't heard me talk about this, or for those who might be regular listeners but feel that I should run ads, like every other podcaster, I'd like to explain my philosophy around funding this work. And you might find some of this surprising, because I actually do. I don't want to run ads here, even for products and services that I love and use myself. And there are many reasons for this. For example, The New Yorker magazine recently inquired about sponsoring the show. Now, I love The New Yorker. I've read it for 30 years. It's one of the best magazines on earth. But it also, from time to time, publishes articles that are inaccurate or highly misleading especially where science is concerned. And what listeners value most from this podcast is my effort to get at the truth. You want to know what I really think. And I don't want to create any incentives that could make it more difficult for me to simply tell you what I think. If I were taking a lot of money from The New Yorker, would I be free to say that one of its writers had just published something scandalously stupid? Maybe. But the point is, I don't want to have to think twice about whether something I think is important to say might upset a sponsor. And you don't want me to have to think about that either. My goal with this podcast is to create a forum for honest conversation of a sort that scarcely exists anywhere else. I want to talk about the most pressing issues of our time without looking over my shoulder and worrying about who might be offended. And there's no way I could do that while depending on ads. But that leaves us with a challenge of how to fund the show. Many of us regularly pay $3 for a cup of coffee, and we don't think twice about it. Yet it would suddenly seem onerous to pay $3 for something that actually brings us much more value than a cup of coffee ever could. I'm guilty of feeling this way myself. And frankly, it wasn't until I started podcasting that I saw the situation from the other side. And asking for listener support is something that I approached with real trepidation in the beginning. However, having done it, I've discovered that it's actually the most straightforward relationship I can have with an audience. And that really was a surprise to me. Just think about it. If you want to read one of my books, you have to buy that book before you even know whether you'll find anything of value in it. And if I want you to read one of my books, I have to convince you to buy it before either of us know if you'll find anything of value in it. That is a strange transaction, and it almost never reflects the actual value given or received. Plus, there are publishers and booksellers standing between us. There are people trying to get you to buy a book, and there are people trying to get me to sell it to you. But this podcast is free so everyone can listen to it, which for the purpose of spreading ideas is the best situation possible. I'll reach more people within 24 hours of releasing the next episode of my podcast than I will over the course of a decade with my next book. And if some of you find this podcast valuable, then you can support it to the degree that you do find it valuable. 
which is the transaction that most honestly reflects whatever benefit you get from my work. And it's born of a direct connection between you and me. There are no third parties here with their own interests. Now, it's a problem that so many people expect to get podcasts and other digital media for free. We've trained ourselves to expect this by creating an internet economy based on advertising. But advertising is not free because these companies want some of your time and attention. That's what they're paying for. And every podcast that relies on advertising contains five or ten minutes or more where the host reads ads. So there's this cost to the host's honesty or perceived honesty. If I spent the first five minutes of every show trying to sell you a mattress, you could reasonably worry about whether my enthusiasm for it was sincere. I mean, what else might I exaggerate if I'm willing to assure you, week after week, that memory foam will solve all your sleep problems? By self-funding this platform together, we're creating one of the only forums that is truly free from the outside pressures that are conspiring to make honest conversation on hard topics so rare. Now, digital media is experiencing a race to the bottom, and the reliance on advertising is what is dragging it down. Most of what we're worried about with companies like Facebook and Google, the invasion of privacy, the undermining of our politics, the spread of misinformation, can be directly attributed to their reliance on ad revenue. What we need is a new ethic and culture of sponsorship, where each of us takes the time to support work we value. Otherwise, the work won't get done, or it won't be nearly as good as it could be and it will always be compromised by bad incentives. Even the best newspapers and magazines now resort to clickbait headlines and hit pieces designed to maximize traffic, because they have to sell ads against that traffic to survive. The result is absolutely toxic. Even the people at the pinnacle of mainstream media, people being paid tens of millions of dollars a year, can be fired over a tweet, or because they express an unpopular political opinion, even on their own platform. Depending on what you do for a living, you might feel this same pressure yourself. What do you think is true, or might be true, or might be worth discussing with an open mind that could get you fired if said in the wrong context? I'm working to create a platform where I can think out loud about precisely those things with the smartest and most courageous people I can find. And I need your help to do this. Again, I totally understand the reluctance to pay for media online, and I feel it myself whenever I hit a paywall. For instance, I already subscribe to the New York Times and the Washington Post, and then someone sends me a Wall Street Journal article, and I hit their paywall, and I think, forget it. I just can't get my credit card out again. But more and more, when I decide that there's something I value, I just automate my support for it. This is what I'm doing with other podcasts and blogs I follow that rely on audience support, and it's what I now do with charitable organizations like the Against Malaria Foundation. I don't want to have to keep rediscovering my commitment to saving kids from malaria. I just want to decide once and then know that I'm supporting this work at a level that I'm comfortable with. So for those of you who are regular listeners who derive value from my podcast, I want to encourage you to support the show at a level you're comfortable with. But I also want to be clear about one thing. There are some of you who shouldn't support the show no matter how much value you get from it. If it causes you any financial stress to give even a few dollars a month, then my appeal for listener support is not directed at you. For everyone else, please know that the small percentage of you who have begun funding the Waking Up podcast in a recurring way, whether monthly through my website or on a per-episode basis through Patreon, are making it possible to keep the podcast going, ad-free. And if the show grows in interesting ways in the future, it will be because of regular contributions, even in small amounts, from listeners like you. So thank you.